This is The Comics Alternative, Episode 257, another publisher spotlight on Conundrum Press. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. That's right. And on this week's show, Andy and I are going to discuss the fall releases from Conundrum Press. Yes, this is another publisher spotlight, and once again, we're looking at the releases from Conundrum Press. But before we get to that full discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts can be anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover. But every now and again, you can find discounts that are more impressive than that. That's right. And this month is in every month. Uh, there's a load of bundles that you can take advantage of. That'll give you a deeper discount on multiple comics from the same publisher than you would get if you bought those comics individually. And there are a bunch of different bundles from DC at 45 to 50% off, as well as Marvel and Valiant. So check those out. That's right. November, great discounts this month, but you can find it every single month at Discount Comic Book Service. Their website is dcbservice.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Well, Andy, how have things been? It's uh, been a while since we have podcasted together. And outside of, what, a uh, little slight cold or whatever it is that you have, I hope things are going well. Yeah, they're okay. I do want to give listeners a warning that I, I have a I have a cold. I'm a little stuffed up. <laughs> uh, so if I sound even more laconic than normal, uh, <laughs> that's that's the reason. Uh, but um, I've been busy. I uh, got back last weekend. I guess it is now. It seems like it's been a lot longer um, uh, from um, the uh, ICAF, the International Comics Art Forum conference was in seattle and that also happened to coincide with the uh short run comics festival so um i got to do uh do both of those things and uh and a bunch of other comics related stuff while i was in seattle that's good Uh, so it was a successful trip outside of maybe possibly picking up some kind of illness there yeah yeah possibly either the illness I got the illness there or it was something that was lying dormant uh, and my body was just allowing me to get through that conference before uh, <laughs> this this kicked in. Uh, the Short Run Festival was, was actually pretty cool. I don't know if any of our listeners have, have been to this, but um, it was packed. Uh, so I, I only got to um, see a few people, but I got to talk to uh, people that we've either had on as guests or – um, have reviewed their stuff. Um, so I got to talk to, um, very briefly got to talk to Julia Wirtz, uh, Anders Nilsson, um, Emil Ferris, Emil. Well, yeah, well, that's what I wanted to end it with Tom, (laughs) Tom Van Dusen, who's, who's new, new books I picked up and they're, they're hilarious. Um, and, um, yeah. And, um, Colleen Frakes, uh, talked to her for a little bit. Yeah. And then Emma Ferris was, uh, one of the guests of honor there. And, um, I talked to her for a while. Not only did I, um, what was, what was an, an interesting and really kind of, I guess, humbling experience because, uh, she recognized my name first off and then 
but couldn't kind of place where she knew it from. And then I started laughing and she said, I know that laugh from somewhere. Um, you do the podcast. You had that podcast where you disagreed with your co-host about a spoiler <laughs> in the book. And so, um, I was like, yeah, that's crazy that you know that. And then, um, and then she confirmed that I was right. So, uh, <laughs> that was, that was good. That was good to experience. But I also, also she, um, she had her daughter there, uh, who was the model for Anka in, um, in my favorite thing is monsters, hmm. which, uh, was, was very interesting to, to meet her and talk to her as well. Uh, but, um, Ferris was also wearing dark glasses the whole time because she's got some eye strain issues while working on volume two, um, which is, is moving along. So, uh, I hope we get to see that, uh, possibly by the April, publication date maybe maybe later but she's she's working hard at it and it looks like it is um uh, it's taking a toll oh wow you know it's a weird coincidence because i guess about a week and a half maybe two weeks before you met her um she had responded in fact she she likes a lot of the things that i post on for the podcast on instagram and i can't remember what it was but she did something more to one post, I can't remember which one, than like it. She may have made a, com made a comment, and so I commented back to her on Instagram, you know, thank you very much for listening to the show. Uh, and, of course, she remembered who we were, obviously. Mm -hmm. you know, she told me as well. And then I asked her if she wanted to be on the podcast for an interview when this second volume of My Favorite Thing is Monsters comes out. And so we carried the conversation on via email, and she said, sure, I'm up for it. But she told me what she told you, that it's taken a little longer than uh, she had anticipated. But when it comes out, she said she'd be more than happy to be on the podcast. So, yeah, we, we have a guest lined up uh, for some time, we hope, sooner rather than later. But uh, I know I'm really looking forward to this next volume of the book, of the series. Yeah, yeah. I just, in fact, had finished teaching the first volume uh, in the intro to comic studies class I'm teaching right now and students loved it. And I got to convey that, um, that to her as well. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to that, that second volume. Um, and then looking forward to the possibility of interviewing her down the line. Right. Yeah. You know, my favorite thing is monsters is getting quite a bit of traction. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that both of us, we don't know yet, but both of us will mention this in some form or another at our best of year end show, uh, the very last Wednesday of the year. Um, but I know that my favorite thing is monsters made at least the next round on Goodreads best of, uh, hmm. 2017 list, uh, because I got a call for initial votes from the various categories. And really the only thing I voted for was in the, comics or graphic novels category and i voted for my favorite thing is monsters and then mm -hmm. i don't know several days ago i got another notification that the next rounds are coming up and so i guess i could vote again but uh wish her the best of luck there yeah yeah and i'm sure all of the all of the year-end lists i yeah. would guess unless they're really really stupid <laughs> are gonna have um my favorite thing is monsters somewhere on there. Yeah, I agree with what you said about uh, the stupid part. <laughs> uh, um, well, you know, something that is not stupid at all is comments that we get from listeners. And I want to I want to give a shout out to and this is the name she goes by on YouTube, the Frog Queen. Uh, she has her own YouTube channel, in fact, and does quite a bit of discussion in terms of comics, and she commented on last week's episode where Paul and I looked at Kid Lobotomy issues one and two, uh, the, uh, I guess you could call it a graphic novel, even though it's quite short, but it's more of an educational text, Carnival of Contagion, and then Chris Weir's monograph. And so she commented on this and sent us, you know, quite substantive message or messages Via YouTube, I'm finding more and more people are responding to us through our YouTube channel than through other means. 
But she wanted to say uh, her initial comment was, hey, cool. I also have been highlighting comic Kickstarters because we have the new Kickstarter series. I try to do it once a week, which is challenging with all the various things I try to cover. I'm also covering Kid Lobotomy after every issue, which is something I don't do with series and haven't done thus far. It's pretty exciting because I want to chat with people step by step through the process. But then she goes on to say, I do have to disagree with this idea that the story is trying too hard to be hip, which is to some degree what Paul and I had mentioned last time. Actually, we said that uh, uh, Shelley Bond in her brief comments in the first two issues may have been trying to be too hip, not so much Milligan. She says, simply because it's a large part of Milligan's own interest to be deeply involved with music, musicians, and that sort of scene. I, for one, have played in bands for years and would never claim that I'm hip. Uh, in fact, I feel I can relate a lot to kid lobotomy in a way that perhaps is due to being batshit crazy myself. So thank you very much, Fro- Frog Queen, for your comments and for listening to the podcast. I have listened or watched uh, a variety of your videos at the YouTube channel. And so if you guys do want to check out uh, the Frog Queen's YouTube channel, just look for just go to the frog just go to the frog queen uh, search for that and uh you will find out what i'm talking about she she provides i think brief insights in video form of the kind of things that you and i discuss andy yeah that's good <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead and jump into this week's episode because we got a lot to cover. Now, Andy and I, we've been planning to do this for a while, uh, do another publisher spotlight on Conundrum Press. We did one, uh, I think, a little over two years ago. And we're going to be looking at six books that are part of their fall releases. Now, let me qualify this. It's the fall releases of Conundrum Press in the United States. These books actually came out back in the spring in Canada, and in fact, they de- if I'm not mistaken, they debuted at TCAF, but according to the publisher Andy Brown, because of various reasons, uh, they were going to be released in the fall in the United States. So for those of us who listen to us in Canada, this may be old news, uh, but these books are, have more recently come out in the United States. And the six titles that we're going to be looking at are Duran Duran, Amelda Marcos, and Me by Lorena Mappa, Dreams in Thin Air, written by Michael M. Nybrandt, with art by Thomas E. Nicholson, Morton, A Cross-Country Rail Journey by David Collier, James Cadelli's graphic novel Getting Out of Hope, a collection of stories, Mr. Morgan by Igor Hofbauer, and then we're going to conclude with Arn Saba's The Collected Neil the Horse, although Arn Saba is going by Catherine Collins today, and we can talk about that more when we get to the Neil the Horse text. But we're going to begin with, I guess, the three memoirs or autobiographical-ish narratives of the bunch And the first of those, Duran Duran, Imelda Marcos, and Me, and this is by Lorena Mappa. Um, This is the very first thing I've ever read or even heard of uh, of Mappa. Is is it the same with you? Yeah, I mean, I may be wrong, but I get the sense from even from the book that this is the first uh, comics work that she's that she's done. Well, she's done other illustration and things like that. Yeah, uh, that's my sense of things, too, and we get that, I guess. I don't want to give away any spoilers. I don't know how much of a spoiler it would be, but the things that happen in the final pages of this book in some ways kind of turn in on themselves in a self-reflexive way, um, Mm -hmm. which to some degree kind of explains this book. Uh, But also, I think that's the part that gives both of us this sense that this may be Mappa's first book of comics, even though she has a background in art. Right. Right. Um, So how would how would you describe this uh, memoir? Um, 
I would describe this memoir as as Persepolis in the Philippines. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's a Good lot point. of parallels here here to Persepolis in terms of, um, you know, uh, taking place in, in in similar time periods, but also seen uh, feeling like a book that's aimed at a um, a Western audience who may be unfamiliar with. Um, you know what what went on during the Marcos regime and the uh, and the peaceful overthrow of of that government. Um, what was it back in the eighties? Right. Yeah. the The early to mid eighties is when things uh, got notoriously bad, at least in terms of the international news. Right. Right. And so it. Um, you know, it, when I say it seems to be aimed at that audience, what I mean is that it it, it feels like a very um, didactic or educational book to teach to teach western readers in particular about um what life was like at the time much much like persepolis teaches uh, it is is aimed at a similar audience to teach about the um the uh islamic revolution in iran in the 1970s right and, and i think comparing it to persepolis makes sense although for me there are two main differences between Duran Duran to Mel DeMarcos and me, and then then Persepolis. One is that um, Satrapi's story is much more, I think, embedded from beginning to end in what was going on in Iran during the late 70s Mm -hmm. and that affected her life and and then after. Mm -hmm. Um, With this book, Duran Duran to Mel DeMarcos and me, we're not introduced to the politics and the things that were going on or at least heating up in the Philippines until, I don't know, maybe about halfway through. Right. Um, and then that's when I guess the political cultural significations really start to kick in. The, the other thing I think that it's, it's a difference between Persepolis and this book, you know, even, even though they're quite similar is the, in Duran Duran and Mel DeMarcos and me, uh, Mappa has a much more personal jumping off point. Um, with uh, Persepolis, there wasn't really an initial, I guess, traumatic event that's very personal, like something happening to the family or whatever. Uh, nothing very specific that kind of launches the narrative. But in this book, what sets everything off is that Rena or is what she's called. Her name is Lorena, but her friends and family call her Rena gets a call because she's living in the United States or I'm sorry, in the, in Canada, but she gets a call that her father has died. He died in an, in mm-hmm. a, in an auto accident. And so she, her husband and her old, their oldest son travel to the Philippines. And it is the, the occasion of the death of the father and this trip back to the mm-hmm. Philippines that, that more or less launches her story, right? So throughout this narrative, we, we're going back and forth from present to past as she's remembering things. And, you know, the way I think that Mappa handles that transition is is quite effective. And I even appreciate the way that she does this within a single page. You know, many times in making a scene-to-scene or a time-to-time transition, many comic artists will use the page, right, as that moment of – or the turning of the page as that moment of transition. But it seems to me that more times than not in this book, what Mappa does is to make the transition from the past to the present and then back, or from the present to the past and then back, within the panel layout of a particular page instead of waiting until you turn the page for that transition. So I appreciated that. I mean, not that there would be anything wrong with, you know, doing it, you know, the other way. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's this, the occasion of her father's death that really gets things going. And, uh, And I think that's another difference. But you're right. I mean, this is quite educational for the reader in terms of some of the ins and outs and the detail of what was going on in the 1980s, the mid 1980s in the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so then in that sense, it reminds me also of a lot of, um, of immigrant memoirs in a uh, graphic novel format or, um, or, you know, the memoirs of the children of immigrants. So for example, like a uh, GB trans Vietnam America, um, you know, has has as its kind of frame, 
of uh, in the pres the present moment of of Tran going back to, or not going back to, but going to Vietnam where his his parents had emigrated from when his grandfather and at another point his grandmother dies. Mm. So it it's reminiscent of uh of a lot of different um I think immigrant narratives or children narratives of children children of immigrants that involve uh, either returning to or for, in the case of children going back to their parents' native country uh, on a, upon the death of a of a family member like a father or a grandfather and and uh, and one example that comes to mind is is GB trans Vietnam America which which involves that as well so um, and I don't I'm not not necessarily saying that Mappa is is kind of copying these things or, or, uh, you know, works like Persepolis or Vietnam America, but that it, it kind of fits into a type of a type of memoir, mm -hmm. right. That, that does these things. And it seems to be a, a very useful and convenient then framing device to have that, that return being the launching point for all these different memories. Right. Um, you know, I was thinking as you were describing some of the tendencies of certain memoirs that uh, <laughs> this and then the next two titles that we're going to be discussing, um, on the one hand, you know, too bad they you know, couldn't make it into your book that we should say just recently came out, Autobiographical Comics. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Um, but on the other hand... As you've said before, I'm sure you're tired of having to focus quite a bit on autobiographical comics. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and that's one of the things. And again, just emphasize that you know Andy has a new book out, autobiograph autobiographical comics, as part of the Bloomsbury Comic Study series. It, I think the release date was what November second. Yeah, yeah, and I was in Seattle when it when it got released, so um, that was that was fun Great. to have that going on at the same time as doing my doing my presentation at ICAF and, um, uh, ICAF, the, the board at ICAF was, was generous enough to include a flyer for the book and for the superhero comics book by Chris Gavler in the, um, in the conference folder. Cool. So hopefully that'll, will generate some, um, some sales, but I, yeah, I thank, in particular, thank Brandon Costello for for doing that because he's the one who handled the program, yeah, and slid that in there for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, again, congratulations. And I know this is kind of a side note to what we were discussing, but I thought mm -hmm. it, you know an effective uh, place to to bring it up. Yeah, our listeners should definitely check out this book. Uh, they can find it uh, certainly on Amazon, and it, in fact, if you go to comicsalternative dot com slash Amazon. Click on the banner, and you can get a copy of Andy's new book. And when you do so, you'll also be helping the Comics Alternative if you click through. Okay. Okay. So that yeah, that's the sales pitch there. But <laughs> um, but yeah, it um, I mean, it you're right that Mappa's book does fit into kind of a trend without being derivative. I think uh, mm -hmm. because I I quite enjoyed this, and and one of the things I that particularly appealed to me about Duran Duran, Amelta Marcos, and me, which in, in many ways the title says everything about what this book is about is the emphasis on music and especially 1980s culture that we see coming through Mappa's memoir, especially when it comes to music. Now, obviously she mentions her love of Duran Duran and especially Simon Le Bon because that comes up a number of times. It had better because it's in the title, but there are other 80s musical acts that she brings up as well, and not ones that you would immediately think of as, let's say, the 1980s. So, for instance, I was impressed that Prefab Sprout came up a few times. Hmm. You know, that that's interesting that you say that, because uh, not not about Prefab Sprout, but good good for Prefab Sprout that it's in there, um, that uh, I was I was kind of surprised how little the book deals with that. Uh, that aspect of her life. I kind of wish since um, Duran Duran especially was at the top of this list in the title and I'm a Duran Duran fan that there had been more uh, about that or more specifically about the impact of that, um, you know, that new wave music on, on her life. I feel like there, that, that should have 
that should have been a bigger focus of the book, especially the, with the expectations built in the title. You know, that, that's a good point, and I, I, I see where you're coming from there. I, I'd say something somewhat similar when it comes to the Imelda Marcos part of the title as hmm. well, because it's not so much Imelda Marcos, but the Marcos family. Yeah, and, you that's know, true. In, in particular, you know, the, 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 uh, the husband. And because Imelda Marcos is not mentioned that often, although because of her buying habits, especially when it comes to shoes— has become legendary. And so, I mean, that's something that I think most people would recognize. If they don't know who the Marcoses were during the 1980s and the 1970s, then they've probably heard somewhere in life a reference to Imelda Marcos and shoes. But she doesn't come up that much. And so I guess I didn't over expect too much attention to music. Um, at the end of the book, though, uh, it, it's really neat in that she has a discography of music from 1981 to 86, and it does list, apparently, the things that she was listening to at the time. You know, there's, of course, a lot of Duran Duran, a lot of Depeche Mode, some New Order, unfortunately, Madonna, um, Eurythmics, Aha, Echo and the Bunnymen, really big for her, and the aforementioned Prefab Sprout, The Smiths. And yeah, so it's uh, it, it's it's really interesting, and so to some degree, it's almost like a brief trip down memory lane for certain readers like us, I guess, um, that grew up with this. But um, you know, yeah, it, it's a good point you raised that music does figure into this story, but maybe not as prominently as one would think, given the title. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I there's. Um I, I, for me, while reading this book, um, it took a while for it to kick in. And um, I think that it, it really does. For me, it became, again, really interesting when she was getting into the um, the political situation in the Philippines at the time of the Marcos regime. And and also that's where the, the book seems to also kick into a a more kind of linear narrative Mm -hmm. um, and a focus. Uh, I think that there, there probably could have been some kind of editing of this book that would have taken out maybe even some of the stuff where, for example, she speculates about why, um, why Christianity in the Philippines is so much more laid back than, um, than in other countries or, um, her, her kind of historical theory that, uh, misogyny comes about, you know, like institutionalized misogyny came about because some King sometime in the past had mother issues. (laughs) Um, I find those things kind of, (laughs) that kind of like historical and cultural analysis kind of suspicious in this book that I, when I got to that, I was like, Oh, I really wish this, I really wish this weren't in here. And this just kind of stuck to the, um, the events of her life and this specific political situation and not get into, um, you know, these, these kind of more, uh, complicated, um, social historical issues yeah i mean i again i can see where you're coming from i i kind of i guess gave her the benefit of the doubt because given the context of these being her speculations and nothing more Mm -hmm. um i was able to take them with you know whatever amount of salt i may need uh in in terms of uh, appreciating those comments you know I, I agree with you in that the memoir becomes much more, I don't want to say coherent, but I'll use a word that you use, more linear, when we get to the political stuff about halfway through. Before that, you know, you had mentioned that it seemed not to be as directed mm-hmm. uh, of a narrative. I kind of found that to be sensible given the fact that 
with the death of her father, them traveling to the Philippines, and that triggering a variety of memories, this fluid movement between past and present, the fluidity of things kind of underscored the kind of slippery or the fluid-like nature of this story to where it kind of meanders at times, not meandering in a bad way, until we get to the political situation. And so things like the you know, the speculation on misogyny and and certain cultures, mm-hmm. you know, this back and forth between the past and present. I mean, I just thought that that was it, it kind of worked with what was going on in terms of the content, right? So the structure complemented the the dreamlike memory content that we're getting. But um but yeah, it, it does take a decidedly different move once you get about halfway through and then she spends so much time on the political situation there in the Philippines at the time. Right. Anyth- anything else about Duran Duran, Imelda Marcos, and me before we move on? Uh, no, I think I'm ready to go to the next book. Okay. Yeah, and, and as we mentioned, this is the second of three memoirs that we're going to be looking at. This is written by Michael M. Nybrandt, and the art is by Thomas E. Nicholson. It's called Dreams in Thin Air. And this book is also a true story, but it's about... Well, I think this is the only comic or anything we've ever read and discussed on the show that has been prefaced by a world-famous religious leader. You know, we've had some heavy hitters on the show, right? I mean, you and I interviewed uh, Jules Pfeiffer, you know, an Oscar Mm -hmm. winner. Um, But this book has a preface by the Dalai Lama. Right. And Uh, and the the Dalai Lama and... um and Nybrandt seem to have become friends, I guess, through the the course of the you know the events depicted in this book. Right. And if if our listeners are wondering, okay, well, how in the hell are you discussing a book with a preface by the Dalai Lama? Because this is a memoir of Nybrandt's attempts, successful attempts, to create a Tibetan soccer team, or for our European listeners, football team. And um, the, the the genesis of the idea, uh, all of the stumbling blocks that were in his way, everybody telling him he couldn't do it, he couldn't do this, but it was a dream of his, and he was actually able to bring it about. Um, and I, and I think that that's the the book in a nutshell. I've made it sound relatively simple. There 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 more complex pieces to this than that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, or Andy, are you a soccer fan? Um, not, not really. I will watch it, especially around world cup time, but, um, otherwise I don't, I don't seek it out that much. You know, I, I'm the same way and I'm probably even less a fan than you are in that. I won't even watch it. I, I'm mm-hmm. just not a, as I've said before in the show, I'm just not a sports fan at all. Never have been. Wasn't as a kid. My father never watched sports at the house. And so I just grew up not really watching and appreciating sports. Nothing wrong with sports. I just don't watch them. But I don't think you have to be a sports fan or a soccer aficionado in particular to appreciate dreams in thin air. And in fact, I think that there's more kind of inside sports when it comes to soccer commentary in the previous book, Duran Duran and Melta Marcos and Me, than yeah. there is in Dream in Thin Air. One of the things we didn't mention is that Mappa is a big soccer fan. This comes out especially in the last part of her memoir. And she mentions quite a bit of, I, I guess... Um, insider stuff like who the players are what they did Mm -hmm. who did or didn't work for whatever teams and you know for for soccer fans they'd understand that i didn't but that was okay it didn't help me from appreciating Mm -hmm. the rest of the book but you don't i don't think you have to be a soccer fan to get into dreams in thin air right right yeah i think it's it's interesting that in um in mappa's book she had she kind of shows her expert you know she she shows how uh that she 
she has to kind of prove her expertise to others in soccer and her interest and knowledge and, and, you know, her skill as well. Um, because so many people don't believe that a girl could know as much or even play soccer the way she does. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, yeah. So in fact, I would, uh, I think soccer or, or football would be a, would be a good thing to include in the title of that book because it is, it is a bigger, it seems like it's a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially, you know, as, as you get towards the end and, and you kind of, she follows her own kind of personal soccer experience. But yeah, so, um, so dreams in thin air is, is really, really focused as a memoir on these particular, the events that led up to Nye Brandt wanting uh, you know, kind of building the dream of creating a Tibetan national soccer team, uh, which is, um, you know, uh, was was very controversial at the time because um, having such a team would would involve then recognizing Tibet as a country which China does not want to have happen. So the biggest resistance came from the not only the Chinese government but other countries fearing not even getting the pressure but fearing the pressure uh, that that China would initiate if um, if such a team were to not only form but then play uh, against other national teams uh, so Nybrandt has an uphill battle uh, in in the course of this book that that uphill battle is, Partially political, partially it also involves getting um, getting players in the first place who have enough skill to play on a national team and play other national teams, and who also can le actually leave the country mm -hmm. uh, and 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 play. Uh, all of that stuff becomes really um, uh, you know one one challenge after another that they face. Right. Um, and, you know, one of the things I appreciate about this book, Dreams in Thin Air, is the fact that you do have this kind of international political twist to what's mm -hmm. going on. You know, in my brief description at the beginning, I was talking about, you know, Nybrandt wanting to help create this Tibetan soccer team. Mm -hmm. But you're right. There's much more international politics going on and the repercussions from what he attempts to do. Um, various pressures that I think drives this in a way that doesn't make it simple. And in fact, at the very beginning of this book, and I guess you would call it like the intro or the preface, whatever it was, before we get to chapter one, we see Nybrandt as a character going to the Chinese embassy in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. This is in May of 2001. And he you know, walks in, he has some kind of meeting, and then we see him an hour later coming out, and soon after he exits, there is a big explosion inside the embassy. So for this book that deals with soccer to have, even before the first chapter, a gigantic explosion of mm -hmm. the Chinese embassy located in Copenhagen, I mean, you wonder, okay, what is going on here? How does this play out in the story, or how does this figure in? And we don't want to give anything away. You know, is there or isn't there an explosion? We won't tell you. Read the book. But really? Because that, I think, needs to be addressed. <laughs> is that, I think, is a really, really – that was, to me, was one of the most unfortunate parts of this book. Okay. Well, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> want to venture into spoiler territory uh, – or be accused of venturing into sports territory <laughs> again. Um, but, I mean, oh, we can talk about that if you want. I, I didn't want to give anything away. I mean, I thought that that was an interesting hook at the beginning, and it had me wondering, although I will admit that once I got into the book, especially the last half, <laughs> honestly, I completely forgot about that explosion, and it wasn't until I finished the book and then looked back toward the beginning, I said, oh, there was an explosion there. Yeah, but I mean, I think especially in in this day and age, you know, using using the um, you know uh, basically a terrorist bombing as whatever it is being used as, you know, um, it, you know is 
is really it, not not just I said unfortunate, but I think it's pretty irresponsible. Um, I think this book doesn't benefit from it at all. Uh, I, it would have been better if that I think had also been left out um, because um, you know it. I don't think it does what I don't, what it what it's intended to do, which. I think, in fact, it probably does the opposite because I kept waiting for in the, you know, first of all, I'd never, I'd never heard of the Chinese embassy being bombed in Copenhagen, but I didn't, you know, wouldn't necessarily know whether it happened or not, I guess, unless I Googled it. (laughs) Uh, But it also feels like it, it sets up Nybrandt as a potential terrorist. So I'm waiting as I'm reading the book. I'm waiting. So when does Nybrandt turn into a terrorist who blows up an embassy? Um, and uh, I think that's the wrong. And so while well, you you said you forgot about it, I'm like <laughs> kind of waiting for that as this kind of moment. Like, is this really? Are we really going to get the confessions of a terrorist in this book? And you know, it may be. Uh, obtuse on my part to think that that was meant to be literal but at the same time we're not really given any any indication there nor do we really get throughout the book um an idea of of Nybrandt and Mickelson using um you know uh whatever you want to call it, either abstraction or metaphor, visual metaphors. Uh, it is throughout the book, a pretty straightforward narrative of, um, of Nybrandt's experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, so I was take, I would took that. In other words, I took that opening it at face value. Okay. Um, yeah, I, as I said, I was, at first, taking it as potentially on face value, mm-hmm. and, and you're right because uh, I think this takes place on the is it what the third page of that brief introduction? It's the last mm-hmm. one. Um, mm-hmm. So I mean, we don't have much story yet, and there's really nothing on that page, and it's a full page explosion, right? So it, it's one mm-hmm. panel that consumes the entire page, and, and there's nothing really there to suggest that this may be a fantasy. Or just something going on in Nybrandt's head and not outwardly in reality. Um, I guess I wasn't offended by it. I didn't see it as irresponsible. I see your point, especially in this day and age. Um, I guess because it didn't have – I don't know if this is speaking you know, good or bad for the, for the narrative. It didn't have that kind of impact on me after that first part of the book, right? Because I said I forgot mm-hmm. about it once I got into the story. Um, so then that has me asking now, you know, was it an effective introduction? And if we extract it from the rest of the book, does dreams in thin air lose anything? And I would have to say, no, it is. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because hearing your comments now has me thinking, you know, if you take that intro out, mm-hmm. then are we left with a diminished memoir of dreams in thin air? I don't think we do which means that maybe that intro was a bit of fat that could be cut off, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, you, you say it may be a little irresponsible to, to, to have something like that. Uh, and I, I don't know, but uh, I, maybe let's just, I'll just say that other than that introduction, I was pulled in fairly easily to this story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think I would have been, pulled in even more effectively if I wasn't waiting the whole time to see Nybrand getting trained as a, um, as a terrorist, right. uh, like when that was going to happen. Uh, because I think that he, he does, um, he and Mickelson do, do a pretty good job then otherwise of, of, you know, uh, creating sympathy, for for him and for the others who are who are following this dream and making it you know a um you know making the reader see that this is this is something that's valuable something that transcends just a, a game between two teams mm-hmm. but is actually a a kind of major political statement uh and one that you know so that 
you know, and not to give any, not to give this particular, the particular spoiler away when we do find out what happens at the Chinese embassy, that is, that is a great moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I, that, that was the moment where, you know, I really, you really kind of see that Nyberg has become, you know, what he has become through the course of this, starting out with what many people feel is a, a naive dream to and and even even to the reader it does seem kind of naive and then to see him become this very astute and savvy political operative by the end of the book i think is an is a great arc to have him go through right and you know you do see fairly early on that the the very nature of nybrant's project works totally against the when does he turn into a terrorist kind of storyline, <laughs> right? I mean, because, you know, he keeps coming back time and again to the fact that, you know, these are, you know, Tibetan monks in many ways that he's working right. with, right? And so this kind of mitigates any violent intentions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, the very project of trying to peacefully resist mm-hmm. politically through sports is definitely not uh, the turning into a terrorist narrative that uh, you may expect from the, the very first part of this book. Yeah, uh, yeah, I may think, and I think you, you hit on there what was one of the other things that bothered me about that opening, which is that that idea of nonviolence being such an important aspect of, mm-hmm. of Buddhism that um, that I think, like even whatever whatever the purpose of this this explosion is at the beginning um it it that that also seems to challenge um that you know again that that basic idea that that uh, of nonviolence not only of nonviolence in buddhism but that nibrant's efforts are are nonviolent you know, uh, and in fact, that there isn't, um, there aren't really violent repercussions even for this. It is a purely kind of political, um, you know, effort that involves you know negotiation and planning and so on. Uh, so that I don't, if if I remember right, we don't get any scenes, for example, where the Chinese government, you know, kneecaps any of the players or anything like that, you know? So, um, there isn't even, they're not, they are not even faced with violence in opposition. It is, it is just purely this, the kind of larger political stage that they're playing on. Yeah. Although in the first part of the book, there is the specter of Chinese violence, right. Um, through its policing forces, through its military that Nybrandt and his friend encounters, because when the book begins, you know, not counting that, what, three-page introduction, um, mm-hmm. we have Nybrandt and a friend of his, whose name I've forgotten, who— Thomas. Thomas. Okay, they're on their way to um, to China, and they bring with them a tandem bike, and they are which, – which I find interesting. Uh, and they, they're just wanting to, you know— look around tour and they eventually make their way into i guess they they make their way into tibet um but then along the way there is there, military officials in china that seem to be suspicious or at least they think they're suspicious right. of what they're doing this is actually where the idea of for a Tibetan soccer team comes to, to Nybrandt. You know, he goes back to Denmark and then as part of a project he he works on with oh what is that program called? Um, um I, I'm blanking on this, but he, he it's part of a program that he's studying in and as his I guess senior thesis, uh, he wants to create this soccer team. It, it basically the school that he's in deals with geopolitical issues. Um and you know and how to, you know, be a diplomat, how to understand politics of a variety of different nations. And so he wants to use this idea of a soccer team in order to bridge political gaps. And so he goes back to Tibet 
The one violent scene that we actually have in this memoir takes place when he goes back because at one point he is in – what the city? Mathmandu, Mathmandu, and he's there with his guide – and translator, and he happens to be there on Uprising Day. And as the note says in the book, and I'm looking at page 81 here, Uprising Day marks the sad anniversary of the Tibetan uprising against the Chinese occupiers on March 10th, 1959, when thousands of Tibetans were killed. And so what Nyberg witnesses is a lot of people in the streets Mm -hmm. uh, yelling, screaming, and then eventually clashing with the police and it's not just, I guess, local residents, because there looks to be monks, Buddhist monks right. in the crowd as well. And so I think that's the closest that we get to violence in this memoir. Right. Other than that, though, you're right. Um, there is uh, this emphasis on peaceful demonstration and resistance and how nonviolent means can, can do what a lot of people think that violence could achieve. Right. You know, I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking about that opening, uh, but I, you know, I think other than that, I, I really found the book effective, and I think, and I think, moving mm-hmm. in the, you know, ultimately in the end, um, and so, you know, I think even if uh, a reader might be familiar with the outcome of uh, Nybrandt's efforts, there's still there's still something. Uh, to be gained from reading this book. Yeah. Now, you were talking about the ending, and I'm assuming that you got this pamphlet alternative ending to the book as well? You know, I did. I didn't even look at it. Okay. (laughs) Um, And I don't know if this is shipping out in copies of Dreams in Thin Air, like when people buy it in the bookstore or get it on Amazon Mm -hmm. or Barnes & Noble. Um. I hope so, because actually I think that this alternative ending would have been good in the book itself. In other words, if Nyberg had decided to include these last few pages at the very end of this book, I I think that it's a better end to the story because it kind of softens things at the end. I, I think the end that we have in the book proper, Dreams in Thin Air, is effective. Mm -hmm. Um, especially the, uh, you know, the soccer emphasis, but I like the way that this alternate, and this like one, two, three, four, five, five pages of comics. Um, mm. I do think that it is almost like a coda to what happens. And, and there's even quite a bit of humor in that. So I like that ending. Another thing I like about it is that this, Coda kind of balances out or works as a semi frame to those first few pages of the introduction that we were, we've been talking about. Um, hmm. But, um, you know, yeah, I, again, I hope that they do include the altern- alternative ending and copies <laughs> of Dreams in Thin Air because I like it better than the actual ending of the book proper. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't think I actually got that then because I, I got a like a promotion sheet. For the book, and I thought that might be what you were talking about. I yeah. didn't get this. No, hmm. I got the promotion sheet, but there's also, yeah, a little pamphlet that is stapled um, in the middle, and it's the size and shape of the book. So hmm. you can easily, as I have been doing, putting it inside. And then, hmm. huh, okay. Did not get that. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's turn to the third memoir that we're looking at that is part of Conundrum's Fall 2017 releases. And this is David Collier's Morton, A Cross-Country Rail Journey. You know, I have to say that going into these fall releases, this was the book, along with Neil the Horse, the collected Neil the Horse, the ones that I was most excited about. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but whereas, and we can talk about this later, with Neil the Horse, I really haven't read it and experienced it, but had heard about it 
And so that's why I was excited about it. It's like, oh, I finally get the opportunity to really engage with Neil the Horse. When it comes to Collier's work, I definitely knew it. And not that I've read right. every single thing that he's done, but I've loved everything that I've read of his, like uh, Portraits from Life, Just the Facts, you know, that kind of semi-autobiographical at times but but even the kind of reportage, right, the kind of comics mm-hmm. journalism that he does. And I remember when I encountered him, I was thinking, OK, he's one of the only other people outside of Joe Sacco who's doing this kind of comics art. Um, and and I think that that is where Collier has at least initially made his mark is a kind of comics reportage or comics and history. Mm-hmm. Um but I think lately he's been getting more autobiographical because there was from a few years ago, is it Chemo Chimo? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. C-H-I-M-O. Mm-hmm. They got quite a bit of attention that was autobiographical. And now this, Morton, a cross-country rail journey that is definitely autobiographical. So I like Collier. I was highly anticipating this. What did, what did you think of Morton? Um, well – there there's aspects of Morton that I that I really liked and I really found interesting one of which was basically the beginning where we uh where we get what's kind of the impetus for Collier and his family to go on this rail journey which is a kind of um what what do we want to call it kind of career transition moment where he is um you know, working with his primary publisher, Drawn and Quarterly, um, and uh, and has um, I don't know if it's we call it a falling out, but definitely uh, you know, realizes you know, complications that make him realize that he's not gonna um, continue publishing with them, mm-hmm. uh, especially because the, uh, his his previous book kind of fell in between. You know, prose and and comics, and um, and so he then finds out about Conundrum as a possible publisher for his next work, mm-hmm. and um, and he's he's told you know we see Andy Brown in the in the comic, mm-hmm. um, and and Joe Ullman, uh, he and his family uh, even stay at least one night with the Ullmans. Right, right, and and yeah, and so um, the trip uh, really kind of, I guess, becomes this this family adventure that they can go on um, while they're wait while they're while he's waiting for Conundrum to be ready for his new book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's also an occasion for him and his family to. To experience something together, um, mm-hmm. you know, a, a trip. Now, now, this is not the kind of trip that turns into, you know, something like a Chevy Chase vacation. Um, but there are moments that things get quite inconvenient, uh, rough, and a little weird. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I enjoyed the travel aspect of this. Um, I think at times the book may lapse into kind of almost a predictable going somewhere, seeing a particular location in Canada and having this particular experience, then getting back on the train, going to the next Mm -hmm. place, having a particular experience. I I really didn't have a problem with that rhythm. Um, I mean, I do think that things took an interesting turn once they started heading into Manitoba toward the end, and I think eventually their destination is Churchill before they come back. Because, you know, what, okay, um, David Collier, the actual author, not, you know, I guess, and the character of Morton mm. in, this, in this memoir, um, had been a part of the Canadian military, and as such, mm-hmm. he was able to get <laughs> quite a big discount for him and his family in traveling across Canada on the train, at least for a particular period of time. And so that's why he and his family can afford this trip. And they don't make it all the way across Canada. So for instance, they don't go all the way from the East Coast to the West and end up in Vancouver. I would have kind of liked it if they had, 
Mm-hmm. But they go, I guess, about halfway over to the Manitoba area, up to Churchill, and then come back the way they came. Now, we don't see them coming back the way they came in mm-hmm. you know the first part of the book, but, but that's fine. But I think that things did get a little freaky in their trip toward Churchill just because that is a— I don't know, a type of geography that I'm definitely not used to where, you know, the ground in certain parts of the year is very frozen and hard, but at other times of the year can get mushy where vehicles, Mm -hmm. even train cars themselves become lost in the ground. Um, I don't know. It just seems otherworldly to me because it's something, uh, it's a geography I'm not used to. And so to me, it was like that, um, like like parts of uh, Coppola's Apocalypse Now, where things get really weirded out for a moment, and mm-hmm. then they become a little more normal. You know, depending on which version uh, you you privilege of Apocalypse Now. I think either of those. You know, you can find quite a number of those weird moments. And so, I think toward the end of this memoir, things get a little weird, but in a good way. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I liked the the way that Collier tells the story of how he and his family took this trip, what it meant to them, the various locations. This was also quite educational because you know, we were talking about education in terms of the Philippines with Mama. Mm-hmm. I am largely ignorant of Canadian geography, and so mm-hmm. in reading this, I had to constantly refer to a map, and I'm glad mm-hmm. that it forced me to do that. Well, good. I'm glad you feel like you, you learned something from from this book. I think it, um, you know, one of the dangers of doing a, a travelogue in comics form, and there's a lot of these. It is it is its own kind of subgenre. Is that um, is that you have to convey a lot of information to the reader? Um, you know, you have to educate the reader. So how do you go about doing that? Uh, and in this book, Collier does it by having the David Collier character kind of stop and tell his family the history and background and importance of each of these locations that they go to. Mm-hmm. And I just wonder what it would what it would really be like on the part of the family to be traveling basically with the Wikipedia page for Canada. <laughs> um, and whereas I feel like what, you know, even though it's not a travelogue, what, um, what MAPA does and other, other creators have done by having the narrative framed by a retrospective narrator telling that, um, even if it's conveying the same information, I think may may make it less annoying. <laughs> um and so um you know I, I I feel like I appreciated the information I was getting in um in Morton. I just kind of wish it had been delivered in a slightly different way because again, because it it made me um I don't know feeling feel some sympathy for the family to be kind of inundated <laughs> with somebody who's just got all this information and it's giving him it's one thing when he's talking about his you know his own personal experience at the location like this is where this happened to me and so on mm-hmm. uh but it's when he was it's in the military when, yeah 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 uh or even not i think you know he talks about some some places where um you know where he lived oh that's right uh, yeah toward on, the end. On his own. and so with um with that and you know with those things that that makes sense i can imagine a father wanting to tell his his child all about that stuff it's the the kind of you know history and background and so on of of the different different locations that i felt got got somewhat tedious as the as the book progressed and i really like collier's work you know you mentioned some of the other the other stuff he's done uh i, I like his memoirs of being in the um canadian military and uh and other kind of report reportage and um and autobiography he's done um i just i guess maybe wish that this had been framed a little differently you know, that's an interesting point, because in essence, what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that 
the kind of things that Collier had done in previous collections, like, let's say, Portraits, Just the Facts, uh, Hamilton Illustrated, he's attempting to do in Morton, but instead of doing it in a more journalistic way where he is doing this kind of reportage, mm-hmm. um, he does something similar in this memoir but can only do it through the character of himself represented as mm-hmm. a figure in this autobiography where he tells his family – because you're right. The things that he does tell his family and, of course, the reader as a result are this, are very similar to the things that he tells us in terms of the various personages that he's interested in, you know, different facts uh, that have occurred mm-hmm. in Canada and elsewhere – the, the kind of reportage that uh, mm. he is uh, known for, it doesn't work as well as a memoir, you're saying, for you at least. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Um, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't mind it as much, uh, but I guess I wasn't putting myself in the place of the family who had to, to sit <laughs> through these stories. But then again, you know, if you're stuck on a train for long periods of time, then I guess almost any kind of entertainment would be useful i was kind of envious because i i like traveling on trains oh yeah well my my dad um refused to fly Mm -hmm. so we always traveled either by train or by bus um i preferred train over bus oh god yeah but (laughs) but um but yeah i mean and and i i've i've done it once in my adult life um and i wouldn't mind um you know, doing, doing it more because there is, there is something fun about it. Um, that, uh, I like better. Well, yeah, bu- buses are just, um, sketchy and, and, you know, flying is short, but miserable. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's something romantic and I think still sustained that's still sustained, uh, in traveling by train. Um, but yeah, so um, I don't know, and I've, I've I've probably been guilty of, um, you know, o- overly explaining uh, certain places while traveling. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Uh, but um, I yeah, so um, I think there there's a lot I appreciate in this book, but. Um, I, I did find those kind of uh, moments where the book kind of pauses its narrative of the trip to uh, to unload a bunch of information to kind of break up the narrative mm. too much. Okay, so the next three works that we're going to look at are definitely not autobiographical or memoir-like in any way whatsoever, at least Mm -hmm. that that we can tell. I mean, who knows? Um, But they're more straight-out works of fiction or fantasy or whatever you want to call them. Um, And the the next book we're going to look at is, I guess, the graphic novel, if we want to call it that, of the bunch, and that is Getting Out of Hope. This is by James Cadelli. And Cadelli is someone who I was not familiar with before this, and I have I didn't look up to see what else he may have done. Uh, did Did you? No, but it says debut oh, graphic okay. novel on the back. So oh, I forgot um, about I'm assuming that. This right, might yeah. be his only, maybe his only work, unless he's done shorter pieces. Yeah. Um, and so this, in a nutshell, is the story of, among other things. Uh, three friends who are traveling in an RV and they're just venturing out with no specific destination. They are, how would you explain them? Stoners or stoner like in character, (laughs) or at least two of the three are, um, their RV breaks down in a place in Canada called hope. That, ironically speaking, there's not much going on there in this town. It doesn't Mm -hmm. seem to be a place that provides any promise or potential. And when they're there stuck in hope, they meet a few people and become enmeshed in 
to greater or lesser degrees in their lives. Right. And so that's basically what we have going on. They attempt to get the RV fixed. They do for a while. And then that leads to what happens toward the very end of the book. And I think there you have just a rough sketch of what getting out of hope is about. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's a good um, a good general summary of the book. Um, and it, it weaves in and out of these different lives. But we are we are kind of introduced to the town of hope through these three uh, three traveling stoners who are outsiders. And so we get to kind of experience their first experience with, with the town, uh, you know, and, and so we, we learn about it through them. Yeah. Um, you know, as you were just mentioning this, I, I looked up James Cadelli's name on Google just mm-hmm. to see if there are other things that he's done on his Facebook page. It lists, uh, James Cadelli used to flip burgers and edit porn. Now he spends his time drawing cartoons, making videos, and playing the viol- violin. That makes perfect sense, given what I read in Getting Out of Hope. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't see – I mean, he has a DeviantArt page, but other than that, I don't see other things that he has done. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of – okay, let me just say right out. And we try not to be negative on the comics mm-hmm. alternative – let me just say that as critical as I'll be here of the six books that we're discussing this week, this is the one that had the least impact on me. Mm -hmm. Although I think it has a lot of potential, especially in the emphasis on the name of the town hope and what it means with the various characters and not just the three stoners in the RV, but the other people that we encounter because uh, there's, um, there's one superintendent, a female superintendent, what is her name, um, that we're introduced to, who's kind of in a rut with her life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then there is an older woman who seems to be disenchanted with things, and we eventually learn fairly early on in this narrative that she wants to die because mm-hmm. of some things that have happened in her life and where she is at the moment. And then kind of along with this older woman, there is uh, a, a much younger drug dealer who, you know, again, he's kind of kind of a stoner like uh, the three mm-hmm. guys in the RV. And it's the interesting intermingling, I think, of the younger drug dealer who is at a crossroads in his life and this older woman. I, to me, that's one of the most interesting relationships in this narrative. Um, but I think it's how the three guys in the RV, they interact with the, you know, the superintendent, this older woman and this drug dealer at a crossroads. Um, because I think that makes an interesting mix, especially when you throw in the irony of the town's name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, this isn't the first time that a book is, or, uh, you know, a work has used hope mm-hmm. as the name of a town. That is ironic um, or not ironic. I don't know. I mean, we could think of uh, uh, President Clinton's memoirs. Yeah. Uh, since he came from, <laughs> he, he literally came from hope. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, so, um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's interesting that you, you kind of frame this as, as having potential because I think that's, that's part of where um, I was coming at it as as well. Um, I think it's interesting to take this in with um, with other um, other works from Conundrum and kind of kind of get a feel of what Conundrum is like as a publisher, mm-hmm. which uh, is what we try to do in these publisher spots. Right, mm-hmm. right, and so. Um, I think one one thing that Conundrum does, and I think does pretty well, is serve as um, you know a launching pad for some some talent. You know, if uh, I was I was looking a little while ago before we got on the air too, we were talking about the what came out last year, the twenty years of Conundrum Press. Mm-hmm book which is a uh, 20 by 20 which basically focuses on 20 creators 
um, who've who've published or got their start through um, through Conundrum, and um, and it's kind of so it's kind of like the um, and so in a lot of ways it's like the Drawn and Quarterly and Fanographics books that have come out in the mm-hmm. last couple of years too, but that you know that someone like Jillian Tamaki, for example, who's, you know, doing amazing work now kind of came out of, came out of conundrum earlier in her career or, or, you know, Joel Ullman or Mm -hmm. Dakota McFadzine and so on. So, um, so I think that, that conundrum can be really good at cultivating new creators early in their, early in their careers. And so, um, you know, two of the, uh, debut books that we get, um, Duran Duran, Imelda Marcos and me and getting out of hope, um, you know, Mappa's book feels like it's the work of someone who's, who's been more, um, I don't know, practiced and seasoned. Um, mm-hmm. Cadelli's Cadelli's book has, um, a certain amateurish quality, and that may be part of its appeal, especially when you consider the kind of characters that we see in in the book. But um, you know, I think it's an interesting first attempt at a graphic novel, and um, you know, as as Cadelli's skill builds, mm-hmm. I think as a, as both a storyteller and an artist uh, later on in his career. Uh, we might see some of the potential that you described in this book become more and more realized. Um, but it is, you know, it, it, it definitely has the feeling of being a first, a first graphic novel. And maybe that's one of the values that, that conundrum can have for creators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, you mentioned the, I guess the, the, the first timer aspect, Mm -hmm. the more amateurish, just starting off angle. Um, and, Mm -hmm. and I think for me, that's, not only apparent in some of the story elements, but but also in the art, right. which on the one hand, and I think you know you you alluded to this, on the one hand does have kind of a certain appeal, kind of a rougher kind of art that we see with some, you know, for lack of a better term, alternative creators in their works. Um, at other times, though, I'm wondering, you know, how much of this could have been maybe polished a little more. Right. But again, this may come down more to, to personal taste than anything. Um, oh, by the way, I looked at it in the super's name that I'd forgotten was Marie. Uh-huh, so that's right. the character's name. Um, you know, another another thing that uh, I, I want to mention in terms of the books or the narrative's potential that I wish Cadelli had followed up maybe a little more. But then on the other hand, maybe he would have risked being a little too heavy handed here is a location that we get like about at least three different times in this book, but especially at the very beginning and the very Mm -hmm. end. Because when we are first introduced to the three guys in the RV, um, they're parked and they're looking out over a cliff Mm -hmm. that is over a lake. And two of them want to go jumping in. The third one, I guess the owner of the van, the more sensible of the three, rightly doesn't want to do anything like that but they're up there on the cliff and at first i didn't notice it but i had to turn back to see it later is the tree on that cliff that is Mm. barren of leaves and i guess the limbs are bent because of whatever wind uh they have going on up there at the cliff but it looks like a bent claw or a hand that's reaching down and given what happens in this story, especially toward the end, I don't know. I think that more could have been made of that image, again, at the risk of being a little too heavy-handed, that, that Cadelli made, out, made it out to be. And in fact, I don't even think we're given the name of this tree until about at least halfway through the book. And then there's a reference to, mm-hmm. what do they call it, the claw or something to that effect? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I just um, I think that there was quite a bit of potential for that visual image and and what kind of impact it would have and significance for the story content. But. Right. Mm. Yeah. Um, I would be curious, too, to know what, um, 
you know, and I think this is one of the through lines through a lot of this book. What, uh, what kind of editorial involvement, um, conundrum has with, with the creators. Mm -hmm. Um, because, um, you know, there, there are several moments in, in many of these books that we talked about that I wish, that I kind of wish that there was maybe a heavier hand on the part of an editor. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, if, if one of the goals is to help, um, you know, help creators kind of grow, um, then that would be, um, then I could see some value in that too. Um, but I think, I think one of the other things that conundrum does well too is, uh, you know, exemplified by the Collier book, which is that, um, it, it gives well, pretty well known creators or seasoned creators a chance to publish something that might not, you know, fit with another publisher. Mm -hmm. Um, the way, um, we often see happen with, with, uh, you know, publishers like, um, like big planet retrofit mm -hmm. and so on where, um, where you, you do get, um, a graphic novel by someone who might have, um, otherwise, you know, something closer to mainstream success, but has a little kind of side project or a, a labor of love that they want to get out. Um, that uh, that can go somewhere else, right? You know, you know, and you mentioned the example of Jillian Tamaki. You know, getting mm -hmm. her start at Conundrum and then going on to a bigger publisher, Drawn in Quarterly. And as much as I love Drawn in Quarterly material, and same thing with Fantagraphics, it's always good not only to see these. Uh, not necessarily heavy hitter creators, but creators who have a lot of heft behind them um, mm -hmm. when they do things at smaller presses even better when they have had a taste of the quote unquote bigger time and go back to these smaller presses. And I mean, I really enjoyed the, the abominable Mr. Seabrook right. uh, from earlier this year, but I have to tell you, I'm absolutely bowled away by Joe Ullman's collection of stories that he did previously through conundrum. And I know that both Andy Brown and Joel Ullman are close friends, and, and not just business partners. You know, right. where, you know Andy publishes Joe, but um, you know I hope that Joe will go back and do some things for a Conundrum because it is good to see these smaller presses. I mean, I think of something like like Koyama and Conundrum, you know, both Canadian presses as smaller versions of the kind of stuff we see coming out of Drawn and Quarterly. It's just that Drawn and Quarterly has been around longer, and it has more of a track record. So, you know, it, it, I have a you know fondness for underdogs at times. Right, right, I agree. Um, yeah, and that's why I think that, um, you know, taking a chance on on a book like getting out of hope, which may not be in, entirely successful, um, can be an investment at the same time in a, in a talent that, that, um, could build from this moment. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> Okay, the next book that we're going to be looking at is by Igor Hofbauer, and this is a collection of stories titled Mr. Morgan, and Mr. Morgan is the title of one of the stories in this collection. And, oh boy, how, how do we describe um, this collection? You know, the way that I think it is described by some of the publicity material is by linking it in some ways to Charles Burns. Mm -hmm. So if you're a fan of Charles Burns and the kind of nightmarish, surreal qualities of his storytelling, then I think you're going to be really drawn to Mr. Morgan, these collection, this collection mm -hmm. of stories. Yeah. Um, there also is something quite expressionistic about this, and not only in terms of the more extreme fantastical elements of the story, but I think visually speaking, and this is a book that is, it's, it's colors, if we want to call them that, black, white, and red. And mm -hmm. unless I'm forgetting something, I think, are those the only colors we get in this book? Yes. 
Yes, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, visually, it does look lo- something akin to or like a comics version of German expressionistic filmmaking or mm-hmm. expressionistic painting. Um, it, it has that feel. Now, if you're the kind of reader who turns to or prefers narrative with some kind of sensible coherency, <laughs> you know, yeah. whether it be fiction, prose, comics, what have you then this may not be the book for you because Mm -hmm. the stories in this collection, I was about to say more times than not, but I think arguably in every instance um, are going to be these kind of abstract assemblages of images that requires the reader to do more work. And I think that's one of the things I really enjoyed about Mr. Morgan is that these are stories that require the reader Mm -hmm. to participate in the, and I'll put, qualifying quotes around this word narratives Mm. uh in the collection because some of these things aren't necessarily stories where you have a sequential series of events that are linked in a logical manner um many of these stories work like dreams in that there are associations there are images that conjure other images and the story elements are linked that way very fluid in nature and you know, I have to tell you, as intrigued I was by this collection, because of the way that the stories are told that Hofbauer presents his his comics, it took me a while to get through this because I could only read certain bits at a time. I don't know if I read any more than two or three stories in one sitting. What I would do is I would read one, two, maybe three at the most, put the book aside, maybe read something else or do something else that I had to do and then come back to the book, maybe the next day, maybe that evening Mm -hmm. and then read one or two stories and then put it aside. So I consumed this book in a rather slow and sporadic manner. Um, Now I don't think that should say anything about the quality of the stories or the comics in Mr. Morgan. It's just the way that I read this because I really had to think about these stories a lot. I mean, sitting down and reading them passively is something that you can't do. Right. That that's interesting how you describe your experience because I sat down and read this in one sitting. Um really. A lot of and a lot of it was because so much of it is silent, mm. you know. And and so maybe, you know, I I you know, could have devoted maybe more time to lingering on on each individual panel and so on. But um, you know, uh I and I think your your mention of how you know, you kind of put narrative in quotes is, um, I think dead on. Uh, I think this was a book that I, I liked experiencing, Mm -hmm. um, rather than kind of trying real hard to follow what was going on. Um, experiencing as if, you know, you're again, entering this kind of nightmare world. And a lot of that, um, that quality of experiencing, it comes down to, um, Hofbauer's design sense. Um, you mentioned the German expressionism. Some of the publicity talks about Russian constructivism as well. And I think that's definitely visible in his, um, his use of text and layout. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, that, that combination I felt for me made this just a, you know, a really fascinating book to just to look at. You know, and even now when I'm I'm kind of paging through it to try to remind myself of <laughs> which which stories st- even stood out to me since, you know, and and maybe reading it in one sitting is, you know, both a good and a bad idea. I mean, I think reading it in one sitting, the stories tend to to blend into one another because they're all kind of a, of a very similar tone. But um, but at the same time, you get immersed in that in that nightmare world that's set up by the design, uh, by the panel layouts, um, by the, the different, the, by the images and, and as you mentioned, the color. Uh, and so I really, I really appreciated the book on, on that experiential level. You know, I think that makes sense that this is something to be more experienced than let's say to try to make sense of, Uh um, the way that 
I at least started reading the book, and I think two-thirds of the way through, I quit trying to think about and linger back over and reread these stories in order to make sense of them. That's what I was doing at first, and I think the last third of it, I just said, okay, I'm just going to read, and whether I understand what's going on or not, I'm just going to let it seep into me or over me or or however you want to describe it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I got more out of doing the latter than the former, uh, but the, yeah, I think there are two different ways of reading. Um, and by the way, I, I, flipping in the, um, the inside fun co- front cover, I, I see this reference to, to Charles Burns. And in fact, someone we've discussed on the podcast, at least yeah. a couple of times, Nina Bunyavec says that, uh, you know, Igor Hofbauer is the Charles Burns of the Balkans, right. uh, which is interesting. You know, I think that the stories that have the most narrative coherency, it seems to me, are those that are longer. And two, uh, I've turned to because they kind of stand out. One is fairly early on in the book, and that's Olympia. Yeah. And then another one is in the last half of the book, Desmond Saliva. Mm -hmm. And the story is as freaky as the title uh, (laughs) suggests. And, and those are stories that, as dreamlike, as fluid, as ambiguous as they are, I think that there is nonetheless some kind of storyline that you right. can discern throughout. Um, other stories, especially you know some of the shorter ones that uh, are sprinkled throughout this collection, you know, <laughs> may be almost completely without any discernible storyline. But again, I mean, it's as you pointed out. There are things that uh, maybe you should just experience in, instead of trying mm-hmm. to, to make sense of. Yeah, I think um, you mentioned Olympia. That may be one of my favorites just because not only um, – because once once you kind of get what's happening in the story, the, the narrative makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but also that there is still this uh, this grotesque element that you would expect from someone being compared to Charles Burns. And – but also I think um, – I think Hofbauer's design sense really, really shines. Um, you know, you got this this mysterious figure in a pinstripe suit and sunglasses. Um, just the look, the look of that character is really slick. Um, and the the title character, Lady Olympia, lives basically in a kind of bird cage that's attached to a, the side of a cliff. And I really kind of lo- I love the design of that. Mm-hmm as well um and so um you know this this is a story i feel like a story that that worked pretty well along with a good showcase for um hofbauer's style visual style yeah and you know again about this particular story olympia i couldn't help when i read this to think of sunset boulevard Oh sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a it is a a bizarre and grotesque version of Sunset Boulevard. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that it says in the back of the book, um, in the um copyright page, that this was um originally published in France, I would guess by. Uh, L'Association, uh, um, or Lasso, as it's sometimes known, the famous, um, famous French publisher um, collective. Yeah, publisher collective that in, that you know uh, includes Dave has published David B and um, Satrapi and Satrapi, right? And uh, um, men, uh, run by Menu, right? I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this this is conundrum bringing this this work to north america right and uh it, it, it is something that is very different it has and, it, and I'm, okay what i'm about to say is not anything that i came up with but what i get from the publicity material including bunyavac's uh comments on the inside front cover i mean this does seem to have an eastern european flair to it right you know from from again as stereotypical as it may be you know my sense of what kind of art broadly speaking maybe coming out of eastern europe uh Uh yeah there's something rather well i mean definitely kafka-esque about this uh and again another eastern-ish european uh artist so um 
Yeah, I, I think this is a book that it is a challenge to what I would say or would be a challenge for traditional comic readers. And I'm not just talking about the kind who read mainstream superhero stuff. I mean, you know, people who turn to a comic and are looking for some kind of uh-huh. sensible coherency uh, or any reader of that kind, uh, not uh, necessarily a comics kind. But, um, but I think it's worth the work. And as you yeah. pointed out, the visuals, the design, I think, are some of the highlights of the stories in this collection. Right. Andy, you want to look at the very last book that we're going to be discussing in terms of the fall releases of Conundrum Press. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking here at the collected Arn Saba's Neil the Horse, as you mentioned at the outset, um, uh, following the conclusion of, of Neil the Horse in its original publication. Um Arn Saba transitioned and uh, is now uh, Catherine Collins, mm-hmm. and um, and Neil the Horse was originally published as I think fifteen issues from um, from Aardvark Vanaheim, the the press that Dave Sim and his wife uh, at the time Denny Lubert uh, had um, had created, and uh, back in what the the early eighties, right. Um, so this was a part of the big early '80s independent boom that came about with the the really the rise of the direct market and the comic book store around around that time. Now, did you read Neil the Horse when it originally came out? I did not. Uh, so this was all new to me. Did you? Yeah, I did. I mean, I came to it. I think th- probably through reading Ms. Ms. Tree okay. by Max Allen Collins and. Um, and Terry Beatty, which was a, uh, which was also, which was originally published by Eclipse, but then went to, um, went to Aardvark Vanaheim, which also became Renegade Press later on after uh, Dave and Denny uh, split up, and um, and so I would see ads for it, and I thought it looked it looked um, really interesting, and and so coming back to it now, which has been a, it's been a while, it's probably been thirty years since I read. Neil the horse. Um, I really remember just not only not only how much I liked it, but how it it was this unique work within that that era. Mm-hmm. Um, there wasn't necessarily a lot of well. First of all, I I can't think of another musical <laughs> com- comedy comic and um, and. Saba had included, you know, songs and dance numbers in most of the stories, which songs was, that he had actually written that yeah. you could play, he would include the, uh, the sheet music to, you could play it. Right. Right. And, um, you know, I can't other, other than I think, you know, Alan Moore <laughs> putting, putting songs in his, his works. I, I don't, I don't know of too many others that have, they have done it. Nobody to this this degree. So it's first of all this tribute to musical comedy, but it's also a tribute to you know classic animation and and funny animal comic strips. I mean, the design of Neil the Horse is definitely inspired by the kind of Disney Max Fleischer style of, right. of early animation, um, but it also has this what I find this like fascinating really entertaining anarchic quality to it Mm -hmm. which allowed saba to to tell a wide variety of stories like uh one of the longer stories in this book a story about um uh, a group of fairies who are (laughs) beset upon by video game spaceships right um (laughs) that's that's I think really exemplifies the um, the anarchy and the um, potential that uh, for for just a huge variety of stories and there's a Conan the Barbarian parody which I think would have been interesting in the context of you know Cerebus Cerebus yeah. exactly 
Um, so, uh, yeah, so it was, it was really wonderful to revisit these comics. And I just remember just how much I enjoyed this, uh, this world that Saba had created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, as I mentioned earlier on this episode, this is something that I would see references to, Mm -hmm. but I had never read. So I was really anticipating this, you know, along with Morton, um, in terms of the fall releases coming from Conundrum. And you're right, there is an anarchic quality to this, and it, it's very much like, as you pointed out, those older cartoons, the Disney, but you know, for me, especially the, the Fleischer ones, where things happen and we're introduced to a premise doesn't necessarily seem to make sense. Like, for instance, the characters in Neil the Horse all of a sudden becoming fairies and then becoming a part of this fairy world, and video games are a big part of it. Uh, in in some way, it doesn't seem to make sense. Things are all over the place, uh-huh. but that's the fun of stories like this. And so, it's not your typical funny animal story like like Carl Barks, but it's it's similar in that it's you know a little more than a tip of the pen to the kind of things that were going on with the funny animal stories you know decades ago, um, with a more contemporary flair. But you know, even though this occurred in let's say the 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 aftermath of the underground comics movement, you know, the nineteen eighties, there's really nothing that risque or no. non all agey about these various stories. Maybe the the most mature things get <laughs> is the cleavage of Mademoiselle Poupé. Uh, yeah. Other than that, though, I think that this is something that older, younger readers, anyone really can enjoy. Now, now that we have three main characters in the Neil the Horse storyline. There is, you know, the titular character, Neil the Horse, who is the most cartoony of the three. Um, I mean, he looks like something straight out of the Disney or Fleischer uh, yeah. animated short there's his friend soapy who is you know if 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 neil the horse is kind of this goofy get into trouble but very good natured kind of character who absolutely loves bananas uh, mm-hmm. then his friend soapy is this cat who is wisecracking cigar smoking uh, mm-hmm. seems much more worldly character to kind of counterbalance the innocence of Neil the horse. And then their third companion is a doll, as the name Poupe would suggest, Mademoiselle mm-hmm. Poupe. And she is the one who seems to be the catalyst for the musical part of this series. And in fact, you know, you mentioned this as a musical comedy. The tagline to Neil the horse is making the world safe for musical comedy. Right, And she is the one, more times than not, that either introduces the music and the song and dance, and there's quite a bit of dancing in these comics, um, or she is the peg upon which the musical element is hung on. And usually it's her longing for something, more times than not, a meaningful relationship. And, you know, and not just, I want a man, I want a guy. It's just, mm-hmm. I want someone who understands me, that I can get along with, who could see the real me and I could see the real them. I mean, very romantic. Right. And, and I think these are fun stories, but at times things turn maybe subtly melancholy. And I think most of the melancholy emanates from the character of Mademoiselle Poupe because she seems to be lonely and what she's looking for at first may seem within her reach, but then it's ultimately outside of that reach. And I think a good example of that is from the, you know, I guess the longest story, if we want to call it the graphic novel within this collection, I think it spanned four issues of the original comic. Uh, and that is the video warrior storyline, right, with the fairies and the video games. Right. And there is a character, the prince of the fairies, that uh, she at first resists, but then she becomes enamored of. And what happens toward the end of that storyline is, I mean, not necessarily depressing, but it is bittersweet. Right, right. And that has, you know, that has the most also kind of that relationship has the most musical qualities and that they dance and sing together, but also that, um, that the prince's culture does not have a concept or conception of love. Mm -hmm. And so, 
uh, Pupé has to teach him what love is, which, you know, is a perfect kind of plot for a, for a musical. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, uh, and, and so that, you know, and he learns love through basically through the songs that they share together. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting to kind of look back and think about this in terms of, of when it came out, because some things you mentioned, I mean, there's just this, this wonderful, innocent quality to it that and um that combines i think with the comedy and so on um but that and 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 i should back up a second and say there's a lot of um supplementary materials to this that deal with um that deal with collins's response to the the you know how how um how it was to create neil the horse what the aftermath of the series was when the comic uh ended and what her career was like even after that uh but that you know to to place this amongst the the comics coming out in that era um it is it is unique in that time Mm -hmm. um I think there is one point in which she she teams up with omaha the cat dancer uh (laughs) that might be you know, a less innocent, but still, um, I think comparable work at the time. But, but really, you know, when I think of the books I was reading at that time there, they were, you know, the appeal to them was, was that they weren't, um, approved by the comics code. And then th- therefore they could have all the violence and sex that they wanted to have. Uh, and for most of the stuff I read, it was mainly kind of, you know, like violence. Mm -hmm. And so there's no reason why this couldn't have been published under the code or by any other publisher. It doesn't have any, any kind of, as you mentioned, risque elements to it that, that would have prevented that. So where it fit in that post underground direct market era is, is interesting. It just, it, there's nothing else like it at that time. Right. You know, you mentioned that piece where, uh, Mademoiselle Poupe teams up with o- Omaha. Uh, mm-hmm. it's interesting. And that is the story, you know, the man from Minneapolis, uh, or the, uh, an ode to the man from Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that that comes not long after the story. I was waiting for you where Fred Astaire makes an appearance. Right. And so you have a character team up, in the uh, I Was Waiting For You story that is quite innocent and charming in every sense of the word. And then you get something a little more... If, I, I, the story itself, the man, a note from the man from Minneapolis, I don't necessarily think of as that risque, although it alludes to and it includes a character whose comics were much more mature than uh, Neil the Horse. So, yeah, I mean, th- there's just a lot of variety here. I, I was... Thinking as you were commenting on its unique place in comics during the 1980s, and by the way, we should mention that there are a couple of introductions to this volume, one of which is by Trina Robbins, and you know, she does begin her introduction, uh, which I guess is called an appreciation, where she contextualizes Neil the Horse among the kind of black and white movement in comics, especially independent comics during the 1980s. And how um, Neil the Horse, in many ways, benefited from, but came toward the tail end of that movement. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you were talking about its place at the time, I was thinking, you know, if we had brand new Neil the Horse stories, right? So if mm-hmm. Catherine Collins wanted to bring this back, and by the way, there are a couple of hints in the peripheral material, like the introductions, where we may see in some form or another through some medium, Neil Mm -hmm. the horse again in the not-too-distant future. Mm -hmm. So I'm intrigued. Um, But if, let's say, it came back as a comic, who would publish it? And I I was immediately thinking of Boom Studios, maybe Mm -hmm. their imprint Kaboom, but I don't know. It, It may be more appropriate for Boom because Boom itself... Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be quote unquote more mature comics as opposed to the kaboom stuff. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, Collins does say in her in the back that um, you know that when uh, Andy Brown approached her to do the collected Neil the horse that um, that he also extended the offer for more stuff, and she even talks there in that in that in that last piece about the fact that there are, there are com- completed or almost completed Neil the horse works that um you know that that she could finish mm-hmm. uh but she also is um you know very frank about her health issues that that she went through treatment for leukemia a few years ago um you know she's 70 years old now the um and so she and and she points out she was never a fast artist to begin with um, and had to have a lot of help on on Neil the horse to get it out on a regular schedule by um, by other credited auth, uh, uh, artists like David Roman and Barbara Rausch. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, so she says there she's working on finishing uh, a Neil the horse graphic novel that was completely penciled um, that just needs to be inked and maybe expanded upon a little bit. And then some other pieces that were um, that were worked on as well, but that that um, closing essay by her is is really is really heartbreaking mm-hmm. um, when you read about what she went through, and you know especially um, at the time when she um, when she transitioned and she really does feel like the comic industry. Um, you know, treated her very badly. Even people who otherwise she doesn't name any names, but people who otherwise were were kind of very open and liberal in a lot of different ways um, rejected her. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that led, or that that not only led to, but kind of continued uh, a history of depression in in her life and uh, a, an abandonment of the of the comic book industry until much more recently when she started to receive these you know hall of fame awards uh that that got her uh back in contact with people like andy brown so um you know so as, as delightful as as neil the horse is um you know the back the back matter in this in this book does does point to a kind of dark path that the series uh, creation was on, you know, was behind the series creation and, and in Collins's life following that. Um, And so it ends on a positive and hopeful note that, that there will be more stuff in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it is, it is kind of sad to see that um, a book that was unique and a, a creator that had a unique voice at that time uh, that, you know, at the time that she could have been producing um, more work was kind of excluded from the industry uh, is really sad. Yeah. Um, and, and you talked about the uniqueness of Neil the Horse, and I think we've been mentioning those elements that make this stand out, and, and not only in its time, but I think even now. Um, you know, earlier you made a kind of brief link to the kind of things that Alan Moore is doing. And, you know, Alan Moore is someone who, even in his comics or graphic novels, if you want to call them that, he includes different media and not just comics proper, right? So you have prose along with comics, along with the musical stuff. And that's what you have going on here with Neil the Horse as well. Because, yeah, there is the music, there's the dancing, there's the sheet music that is interspersed mm-hmm. throughout. Um, but you also have sections, like there's one fairly, actually there are a couple fairly early on, the longest of which the story is Neil the Horse in Old New France. This yeah. is another story that spread out among, what, two or three at least different issues of the original Neil the Horse comic comic book. And in this, for all practical purposes, is a prose narrative with 
you know, I guess we could call them comic panels or illustrations uh-huh. that punctuates what go uh, punctuate what's going on at particular times. There's a shorter version of this earlier in the collection, and this is what is it? The the Banana Berg players present the what uh, the buried the buried moon. Um, yeah. And that does something similar, but I think that the old France story is something that is primarily prose with images to supplement. And, I mean, that's something very different, right? I mean, if if you find something like that to this degree in comics today, I think it would probably turn off most readers. Uh, and then to, to compound things, they'd see the sheet music in their comics and wondering, you know, did I actually pick up a comic book? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was curious about the um, the prose pieces and you know and again those those long musical passages as you know being something that um, you know readers might skip over mm-hmm. um, or um, especially with the musical passages kind of figure out how how they fit in and furthered the narrative that they were a part of right. Yeah, you know, this is something that I mean, I, I'm, I'm again, I come back to the question, you know, if this were being published today, who would publish it, or could this make a go of it? I mean, mm-hmm. I think it would be a fun comic to read because of its episodic nature, because mm-hmm. of the absurd situations, the kind of anarchy as you described. I think it would make a fun series, right? Because it's not anything that you would have to pick up for the most part, I guess, from issue to issue to issue, you would just every month or every two months get an installment and then enjoy, and enjoy it for that issue. And you don't necessarily have to remember or go back to revisit what happened in the previous issue. Uh, something like, I don't know, picking up a copy of uh, SpongeBob SquarePants or The Simpsons might be today. Right. Uh, kind of fun, disconnected to what goes on in other issues, uh, but nonetheless a joy. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, unlike you, I wasn't familiar with Neil the Horse. I didn't have experience reading it, but I'd heard about it. So now I got the opportunity to see what all the hubbub was about. And it was justified hubbub. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just as a kind of side note, when I was at Short Run, Conundrum have it, had a table and I'm blanking out on on who was um, who was sitting at the table. Um, who was running the table, but, um, when I, when I said, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm so glad that this book exists now, um, they, they commented on the fact that, um, a lot of people still have the original issues. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that, um, that, you know, clearly for those people who, um, for a lot of people who read and became fans of Neil the horse and of, of uh saba's work um they kept them mm-hmm. you know over over the past 30 years um so i really do hope that this this book the existence of this book does attract a new generation of readers to this great series yeah it, it's interesting that you, that you mentioned the original comic book series of, of 15 issues before we recorded today i checked on mycomicshop.com, which we have an associates program with. Mm-hmm. And I found that, I think if I remember correctly, all 15 issues, I mean, you can still get through my comic shop these, in these back issues. So, you know, if you're someone who likes to go directly to the, so to speak, horse's mouth with the original, then uh, we will, I will include a link in the show notes to the originals that you can get as back issues through mycomicshop.com. And if you do that, if you get your mycomicshop.com through the click-through, then you'd be helping out the comics alternative. Sure. But, um, yeah, I would, I would let reader, listeners know, though, that the – uh, the supplementary materials in this book, I think, are really are really valuable. Oh, I agree. Um, yeah, I would it, I would definitely recommend the book over uh-huh. the collection. But if people want to go back after getting the book and yeah. get the original comics, sure. Those are and 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 one of the things we didn't mention is that the book includes in the back uh, various attempts that Saba did to turn Neil the Horse into a a comic strip that would be published in Canadian newspapers, either as a a kind of full page for weekly newspapers or as a 
a more traditional strip that, uh, as she explains, was marketed along with other strips by Canadian cartoonists as a package deal. Yeah, and you're, I'm glad you mentioned that because I thought that was a really interesting move in terms of arranging this text because, as uh, Collins points out, the strips, many of which, I guess, I don't know if all of which, came before the comic book. And she chooses to put the strips at the end of the collection. In other words, the comic book material first, even though chronologically it came later. And her reasoning for that is that the early strips that she did for newspapers weren't as good, she feels, as the stuff that she was doing in the comic book. Um, And and you can look at those early strips and see a noticeably different, not radically different, but a noticeably different... um, quality to to neil yeah yeah so yeah definitely check out uh, the collected neil the horse i think one of the more exciting titles coming out this fall from conundrum press yes Andy, we covered a lot of books. We started with Lorena Mappa's Duran Duran, Imelda Marcos, and Me. After that, Dreams in Thin Air by Michael M. Nybrandt and Thomas E. Nicholson. And then we looked at David Collier's Morton Across Country Rail Journey. Then the graphic novel by James Cadelli, Getting Out of Hope, followed by the surreal, dreamlike, nightmarish Stories by Igor Hofbauer, Mr. Morgan. And then we wrapped up with, at least for you, was a blast from the past, The Collected Neil the Horse by Catherine Collins. And by the way, we should mention that the outro music at this episode will be a song inspired by Neil the Horse. It's one of the songs in the collection, Bananas Are Here to Stay. Great. So if you want to find great books like the ones that Andy and I discussed on this episode, then definitely check out the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. Unfortunately, these fall releases are not listed there right now, but you can guarantee great prices that you can't beat on all of your comics if you pre-order from Discount Comic Book Service. That's dcbservice.com. Uh, Also mentioned before we go that there were three other conundrum books that Andy and I wanted to discuss. This is, I guess, part of their end of the year release schedule, not the fall ones. We just didn't get copies in time. Uh, There was a collection of essays and interviews on Quebec comics called BDQ. Uh, There was another book, The Case of the Missing Men, and then a Pick a Plot book, you Are Alice in Wonderland's Mum. And I think all three of those would have been interesting to discuss. We just didn't get them in time. But, hey, we had a lot to talk about as it was. Yeah, I would add quickly that I did pick up the You Are Alice in Wonderland's Mum pick a plot book in um, when I was at the Conundrum booth. And um, I've read through, and, you know, it's a kind of choose-your-own-adventure type thing. I read through one, you know, one set of, of choices that I made uh, ended up in really, really dark place. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in following through with that. Well, maybe it's something we could possibly discuss on a future episode. Well, yeah, it's not a comic, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, if uh, you want to get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about our publisher spotlight on Conundrum, then you can go to our website, comicsalternative.com, and there you will find a link where you could leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right, or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Uh, or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at ComicsAlternative.com. And I'm Derek at ComicsAlternative.com. And we also have our Twitter feed, which you can check out at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. But you can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, and the Slack channel. We have one of those now. 
You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us, find out what we're doing, and let us know how we're doing. That's right. Now, next week, we will be back with our annual Thanksgiving show where a variety of co hosts will get together and we'll all tell you what we're thankful for this Thanksgiving season in terms of comics culture. So you can look forward to that. Until then, I'm Derek. I'm Andy. See ya. The licorice stick is mighty sweet, but bananas are here to stay. Peel an onion and you start to cry. Peel an apple and you wonder why. Peel a banana and your feet will fly. Bananas are here to stay. Flicker is quicker, but bananas, they are slicker. From the stem straight through the sticker, it's bananas all the way. Bean sprouts said to the old bok choy that spinach stinks, he's quite the boy. But his salad days have begun to cloy, now bananas are here to stay. Lettuce has the folding green, and a peach can always crash the scene. The long string beans are fashion queens, but bananas are here to stay. The nectarines to the tangelo. Your old man is a hell of a fellow. Still, you wind up in the jello. But bananas are here to stay. Oh, I love bananas because they taste just like candy. Only they're bigger and squishier. And they're bright yellow. And you can open them without a zipper. They're my favorite vegetable. There it is, straight from the horse's mouth. A big potato has got the heat. Bananas are here, bananas are here, bananas are here to stay. Yeah. Hey, what happened? <laughs>